This is Recovery Radio, the first radio show in Rhode Island to offer useful information for the purpose of helping men and women suffering from alcohol, drug, and other addictions. Recovery Radio's goal is to raise awareness about the services and organizations available in the state dedicated to improving the outcome of those with addictions. Recovery Radio, hosted by John Tessoni and presented by Phoenix Houses of New England. Now, here's John Tessoni. Welcome to Recovery Radio. I'm your host, John Tessoni, on a gloomy, rainy Monday. But what a guest I have in the studio today. And here's his book, What to Do When People Become Difficult, Even If the Difficult Person Is You. Ken Pachucci, MSW, is in the house. Ken, welcome, and thank you for joining me today. John, I'm so happy to be here. Um... Just a little background. I was out in Smithfield delivering my paper <laughs> at the Greenville Library and bumped into Ken, and Ken came over to the truck and said, I listened to your show. I listened to your show. <laughs> I said, well, well, thank you very much. I said, uh, what do you do? And he got into this book and talking about this book, and, and I said, well, I'd love to have you on, on the show. And I haven't read the whole book it doesn't have any pictures in it. Oh, yeah, it does have a few pictures in it, Ken. Uh, but, um, and just talking to Ken, um, I think this is a knowledgeable show today. A, a very much a knowledgeable show. Uh, you're in a, a bunch of different libraries throughout the state, your book. Um, what made you write this book? All right. I had a friend at, in the Providence School Department. As a psychotherapist, I work there. And she said, Ken, you have to write this book on people when they become difficult. She then passes on, unfortunately. I'm in a flood in 2010, lost my house, was not going to continue this manuscript. Someone said to me, Ken, you need to complete this manuscript. I said, why? He said, there are, there are people all over the world who need to hear this? What's going to What's going to be in that book? I says, really. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I was out. I was in a flood. You get it. Lost mm. the house. He I said, no, it. do it, please. Mm. So I eventually did it. And and I will meet people. I met someone in a. He was a clerk in Stop and Shop, and he says, "Are you the author of a book?" I said, "Yeah. I want to know more about that book." I said, well, 16 libraries have it, from Jamestown to Greenville. You can go get it or go on Amazon.com, BarnesandNobles.com. He says, no, listen to me. I need to talk to you. Will you sit down? I said, all right, I'll sit down and talk about it. And you can see the look in his eye. I have to have it now. And I meet people. I want it now. I want it now. And then you have people who just want it. Hmm. Governor of the state has it. John Revens, you know, your former senator, yep. colleague has it. Uh, uh, Al Boldesaro, um, he opens up for the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. He has it. I mean, it would go on and on and on. People mm -hmm. all, all over. People from all walks of life have it. And then you have people that it seems to me that it's almost like they're spiritually ordained or pre pre-ready, predetermined. To have this book, it's 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 spiritually spooky, <laughs> if there is such a word. No, I you know I, I I think you're right because me meeting you in the parking lot of a library, and you coming up to me and saying, you know, I listen to your show, and this is who I am. This is my book. Is it's meant to be. Mm. It's meant to be. Mm. And a lot of people, too, that I talk to when I, I do my work at Phoenix House are getting more and more into the spiritual stuff. Mm. Because a lot of times that they they move away from it when they get hooked on substances. They move away from God. They move away from church. They move away from their families. And they become loners in, in their own world. Because they don't feel good unless they take the substances. And you have a system within your book that has caught my eye. And I want to talk about that. 
And I want to talk about your book as a whole. And then I want to talk about what the hell is going on here in Rhode Island and the nation about overdoses, about so many substances uh, entering into our daily lives. Uh, I talk to Colonel O'Donnell all the time, and we're the center spot between New York and Florida on the 95 path, and there's a ton of drugs moving up and down the East Coast. So let's talk about how you got that system that you have in your brain, and you were able to put it on paper, and now you have everybody talking about it. All right. For I don't know if you actually know this, but I was an instructor for the Rhode Island Municipal Police Academy. I did not know that. That's right. I created a curriculum for them, for psychological principles and so forth, in the 80s and so forth. So I'm familiar with what you're saying and what you're going through in terms of society. Here's my take. My take is this. Unless we know the trigger... We can become a victim of the trigger. What do I mean by that? Unless I know what is behind, what is behind what I'm doing, what is motivating me, what is pushing me, what is driving me, I can become a victim of it. So that thought continued my research and my system. Let me give you my system. Let me share it with everyone. It is called it is called the gathering of information self help system. All right. First thing we do is when you are thinking, what am I thinking? That's the first question. You write it down. What am I thinking? Why do we say what am I thinking? Because before you took a step to buy the drugs before you took the step to become obese and eat nonstop, before you took that cigarette you know you didn't want, something was going on in your mind. And unless we know what was going on, when it happens again, we can become a victim of it. Now, Let's be, let's be real. Are we all somehow not capable of having an addiction? No. Everybody, in my opinion, in the world, mm-hmm. if they'll face, each, face themselves completely, they can never say, never me. Never, never me. Mm-hmm. That's, that, to me, is, let's start off with that. So we're all subject to some kind of addiction, whether it be addicted to people, drugs, gambling, whatever. Now, the first question, what am I thinking, before you answer it, you pause. Why do you pause? Ah, I'm looking now at what I'm addicted to. I'm thinking something that's making me want it. What is it? You pause, you're patient, and you kick back and you write it down. What am I thinking? But you don't stop with one answer. You keep, what am I thinking? What am I thinking? Write it down. What am I feeling? Because there's something going on. This is not an accident that you're driven to this. Mm. There's something going on with your feelings too. What are feelings? Let's not put it on the people who have the problem. Let's say we all have feelings, don't we? So somewhere along the way, there's a feeling. What are we feeling? Wow. What I'm feeling, example, write it down. What am I feeling? Hmm. I'm fearful. Of what? Money. I need more money. Ah. So the fear of not having enough money and the feeling is now driving it. The thinking to begin with is driving it. What's our next thing? What am I doing physically? Because we could be doing something unaware that that doing something could promote the stage for the problem. Hmm. Example, I'm driving around. I'm in a car. That's what I'm doing. But I'm a little bit lonely. I don't 
nobody's around in my life. Don't know many people. Kind of uh, don't, not close to many. If I really had to be honest, let's say that's going on. And we're driving around. So when we're driving, it seems to happen more. You put it down. What am I doing? I'm driving. So what am I thinking? What am I feeling? And what am I doing? And we don't stop with one answer. In free association, we just continuously write. Now, where do we go from there? Well, let me. Uh, can I answer yep, that for one please, second? Please do. I would <clears throat> like to answer that. You question. have <clears throat> a couple of maybe four or five uh, answers to those questions. Correct. I want you, to, when we come back, because we're going to take a break, I want you to come back and I want to ask you a question about what happens if you have 15 or 20 answers to those particular questions. And now you're up to the third question and you have 45 answers to the three questions. Correct. I'm sure that young people today and older people who have issues with substance abuse mm. have way more than 45 questions. And I want to talk about that when we come back. You're listening to Recovery Radio. I'm your host, John Tassoni. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Recovery Radio. I'm your host, John Tassoni. Mr. Ken Petrucci is in the house. MSW, psychotherapist. And uh, Ken, welcome and thank you for joining me today. And I want to get back to the three questions that you had. And I had asked you before the break, what happens when someone expounds on those three and you may have 45 by the time you get to question number four? Correct. I mean, you have 45 answers. Yes. To yes. those questions. Correct. All right. Here's where it gets a little bit more complex. There are two ways you can approach this. You could approach it from self-help or you can take your information, which psychotherapists are now using the system, they're using the entire book actually, and go to places like the Phoenix House with your information and now you are really going to do some really powerful work because you have already done a lot of the trigger work figuring out what those triggers are, figuring out the feelings and thinking, and we'll go further with the questions. And when you get all of that, you could take it to the, to the Phoenix House, your place of choice, or you can take those questions now, which are becoming, like you say, difficult because you have so many, and maybe you could go to someone in your family who will discuss it with you, Maybe you could go to someone like a pastor or a priest. Maybe you could go to um, uh, anyone who has some uh, background that will listen and talk with you. But what I don't suggest is you do it alone. Hmm. Isolation. Isolation is one of the friends of depression. Hmm. Isolation is one of the best friends of depression. The more we isolate ourselves, John, the worse it gets. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I have to agree with you. This, you know, I've, I've been around a few people who have isolated themselves and then unfortunately have taken their own lives because they didn't want to deal with anyone. They didn't want anyone to talk to. They wanted to just keep everything inside and then these things happen. And I think that's the case of most people who use substances um, because they push their families away. They push their friends away. I'm fine. You don't know what you're talking about. Even though I'm drinking two cases of beer today, you have no clue. I'm not an alcoholic. Denial. Denial. There's another one. Denial. Denial. And that's when they become difficult patients because they're in denial all the time. I'm fine. Leave me alone. Uh, it's okay. I missed uh, seven days of work last month uh, because I wasn't feeling good. Uh, I'm only drinking two cases of beer today. I'm I, I'm not an alcoholic. And you know what the answer to that is? At least from my your perspective, o opinion as a psychotherapist. Hmm? Let's say your name is David. David, let me ask you a question. You said you're fine. Please, will you be honest with me and your response? Why do, why do I say that first? Why do I say that? Because we have to be set up hmm. to be real. Right. We're not going to be real unless we're set up to be real sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
can you be real with me? Can you really tell me what's going on? I only have one question. Yeah. What is it, Ken? How is your life going right now? Are you happy with the results, David? Because if you're not happy... It's not working. It's not working. Could it be, David? Could it be? Yeah, yeah, Ken. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, well, watch. Uh, well, Ken, um, well, it's not too bad. All right, Dave. It's not too bad. So you told me that you, you have no rent money, huh? Is that good? No, it's not good, Ken. So that's not going too well, huh? No. All right, David. Let's see. How about besides the rent money, you just broke up with your girlfriend the fifth time. Am I right? Uh, I, yeah, Ken, yeah. So is that going good, uh, Dave? No. Oh, so, so in other words, Dave, are you telling me that it's not really going that well, but you think it's going that well? Dave, Dave could you be... Could you be playing a little bit of a head game with yourself? Because I've done it. Dave, I've done it. I've played head games. We've all played head games with ourselves. We've all said that things are going well, but they're not. Uh, all right, Ken. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. I need help. All right, Dave. Let's sit down and talk about it. Hmm. I've done that. That has been one approach I've used in hmm. counseling. Now... <clears throat> Would you? So let me just say one more thing. If you're doing these questions and you're seeing a therapist, it would be good to talk to your therapist beforehand and let them know that you are working on these questions. Yeah, but I don't want to go to a therapist, Ken. I'm fine. I don't want to go to therapist. I don't want to tell anybody my problems. All right. Help me. Help me. I don't. I don't need to go to a therapist. You don't need it. I don't need it. Everything's everything's fine. Is it? Mm. Is it, David? Well, is it really going fine? That's what we get all the time. Yeah, but here's what I'm going to do. Because I've done this. I've already done this. Dave, is it really going fine? Mm. You said, let's see, girlfriend. Broke up five times. Is that really all right? Are you all right with that, Dave? Um, no. Oh. No rent? No money? Huh? Uh, is that good? Man? No. Dave. Dave. I'm not going to tell you what to say or think, but you've told me things are not going well. Do you want to do something about this? Hmm. Are you really willing to make... And incidentally, first thing number one are you willing to change because if you're not willing to change don't waste your time and my time i've actually was in counseling with a couple and i had to be honest and i'd said to the couple you really don't want to change do you i mean do you really want to change well i'm not no no i need an answer because i really need to know this is going nowhere yeah because it's going nowhere and you know what i don't want the money mm. <laughs> i want results mm. so if it's not if you're not willing to change i think we should just do something here and help you find someone you can work with who's willing to accept the fact that you don't want to change i'm not willing to accept that mm. if you're not willing to do something you're not so it all starts with the willingness to change mm. How, how many, how many, let me ask you this question. How, do you get a lot of clients that when they first come in, they really don't want to change until you start asking them those questions? Absolutely. It's a defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. We all have it at times. It's a defense mechanism. Because see, the minute we say we're willing to change, we have to actually work. Mm -hmm. And we're, as human beings, we're sometimes lazy. We don't want to work. Mm -hmm. So the easiest thing for me to say to you is, uh, yeah, uh, change your life. Yeah, why not? Are you kidding me? I'm up to it. <laughs> sure. What, what do you want to ask me? Are you really willing to change? Yeah, I've changed a lot of things in my life before. All right. But are you really willing to change? Straight up. Uh, no. No, no. no. 
So you're really not, huh? So we have to get that out mm. because everything else after that means nothing. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, been right. down yeah. the road before. Mm. You know, and people think that when they go in to see someone for help, that they're going to BS them. And when they leave, they say, oh, I got them. But we're 10 times, well, you guys are 10 times smarter than the patient. And I want to talk about that when we come back. You'll listen to Recovery Radio. I'm your host, John Tassoni. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Recovery Radio. I'm your host, John Tassoni. Ken Petrucci's in the house, MSW. And Ken is a psychotherapist. We've been talking about his book, What to Do When People Become Difficult, Even If a Difficult Person Is You. Welcome, Ken. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. This is segment three. And we had covered... Three questions in the earlier segment. Now I want to cover four, five, and six. Yes. Let's go. Now, John, let's assume, as we continue, you're thinking about what you're going to do, whether it's the drug, the smoking, the gambling, whatever it is. So now you ask yourself this question, what do I need right now? What you need right now might be something that you haven't thought about or dealt with or faced. Now, if what you need is not being satisfied, what are you going to do? You're going to go for the binge. You're going to go for the drug, the gambling, whatever it is, because you need something you're not getting. Right. Now, what environment am I in? What environment? Why is that important? Because by changing the environment, we can change the situation. How many times have we had a bad relationship with someone? We leave that relationship. We leave the house, the environment, and things get better Mm. just by the environment alone. Environments affect us in ways we're unaware of. I want to get, I want to talk to you about that. And I tell this to when I was a senator and I went to schools and talked to the kids. I was a business agent at the training school. And I used to talk to the kids because I felt bad for these kids. A lot of the kids were minorities. And there was a sector where they were from Central Falls, white, middle class kids. I used to say to them, why? Why? You're taking school subjects in here. You're taking, you're getting guidance. You're getting therapy. You're getting, now, when you leave, where where do you go? We go back to the same environment, which it gets right on what you're talking about. The same thing if you are living with someone who's abusing you. You're going back to the same environment. It's back to the same environment. If you're an alcoholic, you're going back to the same environment. Back, to, And you are 110% correct. If you change the environment, you change your friends, you change the people you hang around with, them, you will be better off as a person to get away from that. Make that a chapter in the book. You go to the next chapter. I know a person that was in very, very bad a very bad situation in their life. They went to a counselor. Counselor said, we need to make changes here. The person said, all right, so I should move to wherever. You need to get out of the state. It's that bad. I've it's heard that, that bad. Too. I've heard that. It's that bad. Hmm. Environments affect us in ways we're unaware of. Now, Once you have this information we've been working on, now you say to yourself, all right, how can I help myself here? But now you get into the second phase of my system, which is, all right, you know, let's go back. You know there's something going on with the thinking that's promoting this issue. You know there's a feeling maybe that's behind it, and you know there's a doing, something you're doing. Maybe it's what you need and you're not getting it. Now we have to determine, is there a pattern to this information? We say, well, well Ken, why, why, why do we need that? We already know it. Because patterns 
create strength in results. They create strength in data. When we want to accumulate data, we're looking for patterns. So now you look and you say to yourself, well, let me try this again. So you go back to the book. Go back to the book. Book has section two. Behavior information session two. Ask yourself the same questions. Relaxed. Pause. Give yourself time to think. What am I thinking right now? Before I act on that drug. Before I act on those cigarettes. What am I feeling? Hmm. What am I doing? What do I need right now? What time is it? Is another issue. Because there are certain times of the day we might be more susceptible to our binge. Now, what environment? Now, if you see these patterns start coming into play, now you say, ha, all right. So, what do I need right now? I need companionship. I'm not getting it. I've got to be honest with myself. I need to open up to my friends. All right. I need I need a friend I can count on. I need to be able to call a friend. Now you have a replacement keyword here. Let me repeat it a second time. A replacement for that need. So if that need is rushing up and saying, knock, knock, here I am. I'm going to knock you down and you are going for that drug. You're going to say, no, I'm not. I'm going for my telephone because I have a friend who's going to talk to me because that's what I'm really upset about is I'm not close to people. I don't have anybody I'm close to. Mm -hmm. But my friend has agreed that he's going, he will accept those calls. So now you have a replacement. Ah, replacement. So you say to yourself, well, why is that important? Because most of your relapses, if you really understand them and study them, come from a lack of knowing your trigger, a lack of replacements, and they come from not dealing with this. It's like, I have this problem, eh, you know, I'm 60 pounds overweight, or, I, or I, I'm smoking, but I, I, I'm just not going to deal with it. That's the problem. Unless we deal with this, we will not have a resolution. Let me give you one example. I was in conference with a nurse. She says to me a couple, about a week ago, Ken, listen to this story. I know someone for 20 years was doing well with addiction. I said, oh, that's interesting. One day, one day, one hour, everything turned around. There was a trigger, a cue, a red flag they didn't know about, and they went down 20 years later. So uh-huh. let me say one more thing. My opinion. It's just my opinion. There is no such thing as a forever, forever cure. The minute we say we will never go under, the minute we say we will never have an addiction again, we are in muddy waters because an addiction by its very nature says it can happen again. And if we are aware that it can happen again and we, and we know it can happen again, we might know those cues. Do you see how it all works? It takes work. It takes work. work. It's, this is not something that, like you said, you, you, you're, you're free for 20 years. And that one particular episode puts you in a spin that will take you down. And I, and I say this to people when I talk to them about, well, I've been, I've been clean for uh, six years, two months, and 13 days. Oh, that's good. Well, you need to get ready for the 14th day. The next day, and then the next day, and then the next day. It's a constant battle. It's a constant battle to make sure that you're focused on recovery. Because once you let your God down, it hits you. Yes. And it could hit you hard. And that's why I think, in my opinion, why we're having a multitude of overdoses right now. Because people are staying clean. They get hooked up with someone, and they take the bad fentanyl with the cocaine and the heroin and the mixing, 
in that one spot when they let their guard down, it's over. It's over. It's very, very difficult. And I give the people, I was at the recovery rally this weekend, how many days people were in recovery, how many people stood up on the stage and talked about their kids who've died of overdoses. We're up to about 200 and change right now of overdoses in, in the state of Rhode Island. And we still don't know. We won't know until next February or March when the final count comes in. But this will be the highest overdose in the state will be 2016. And I'm afraid for 2017, 2018, and beyond. Because people are not realizing about these systems that they can follow your book. If I was able to give you a half a million dollars today to buy all these copies of your book, I would absolutely unequivocally give this book the Phoenix House, to Bridgemark, to Kodak, to The Journey, all, all my sponsors to give to their patients to read it and let them understand it. I, you know, I go to Phoenix House once a month and we have meetings with the management. And I see the people in there. And I see them one month. I see them two months. May not see them for three or four months. Come back the seventh or eighth month and they're back again. Why? Relapse. Relapse because they're not focused. The environment, they go back to the same people that they hang with and do the same thing again. And it's a vicious circle. It's a vicious circle. John, let me ask you a question. Anyone can go from Jamestown, correct? They could go to Jamestown, Westerly, Warwick, Cranston, Pawtucket, Kingston. <laughs> All right. Lincoln, Cumberland, many cities in the state right now and get that book in that library. Newport, for example. Or they could go on Amazon.com if they want to purchase it or go on BarnesandNobles.com if they want to purchase it. When this book was being written, there was a woman who said to me, Ken, interesting you say that. If I had the money, I'd give this book to every high school student she said that to me because why should they wait 30 years to get what this book has to offer dealing with difficulties with people listening skills assertiveness skills i have so much we could cover in this book mm. besides this uh, this addiction segment all of these skills organizing everything meditations everything why do i have to wait which is in the house in Tennessee. MSW, and he wrote a book. What to do when people become difficult, even if the difficult person is you. I think he wrote it for me. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure. But thank you for writing it, though. By the way, Ken. And uh, you're welcome. I want to talk about solutions. And again, I want to have you back on because there's a multitude of stuff that's in this book that we that we haven't covered because this is a full circle book. From soup to nuts. Mm. You know, like your grandmother used to say, oh, you got to get the soup and then you <laughs> move on. All right. So right now we're doing the soup. <laughs> so let's talk about solutions. To and what? We have a national problem, especially here in Rhode Island. We need solutions. What do we do? How do we fix it? I go to the governor's council uh, last week and I sit there and listen to all these people talking. But we really don't have a solution. We're there's talking. A, we're too much talking there's and no action. Incidentally, the governor, Gina Raimondo, has that book. Mayor Fong, Fong, as I understand it from his number two person there, he has it on his desk, I heard, that book. My book. I appreciate that. All right. Here we go. Solutions. Before the meeting starts, one thing we need to establish we have talked about the problem. Let's talk only about solutions. Can we do that? Can we do that is a skill I teach in my book. We need to agree 
before the meeting continues on what we're going to do. Agreement. Can we agree? The person says, well, I don't know if I... No. So, in other words, you can't agree we're going to talk about solutions only. Well, I'm not sure. Well, then, we're not going to talk about solutions. So, I'm not interested in rehashing problems. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say my answer to your question would be be candid and say we have talked about the problems only solutions and plans to resolve this, please. If you don't have that to say, let's pass on your comment. Who has a solution? Who has a plan? Please comment. Can we agree on that? That's what we're going to do. How many, how many people, when you have that conversation, do like Fred Astaire? And they dance around the question. 90%. Do you want to know why? Yes. Because from elementary school on, and I'm not putting down teachers you because got, I'm you part got 30 of the, seconds. Yeah, I'm part of the system. We have not been taught life skills at the elementary Bingo. school level. Bingo. Home run. You're listening to Recovery Radio. Get the book, What to Do When People Become Difficult, Even If the Difficult Person Is You. Ken Petrucci's in the house. MSW, Ken. Pleasure. We're going to have you come on again because of the wealth of knowledge within this book. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Thank you, John.